for this holiday season, something that I'm thankful for is the whole concept of dungeons. And I wanted to bring you a look inside a great resource called Engineering Dungeons. This is by Robert Doyle. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's available on Drive Through RPG. And you can look here at the first page of the full credits here. And this is um, copyright 2007 Troll Lord Games. It's supposed to be, it says, designed for use with the Castles and Crusades role-playing game. I'm not going to be using it for that. I'm going to be showing you it as a resource for random dungeon generation. And maybe we'll do a little roll-ups here. I'm not really sure, but I want to just point out some some of the offerings that are here because it's a little bit more than just random tables, although, of course, it is mostly random tables as the name random generation system would suggest. Dungeon basics. Several factors are vital to the development of a thriving and realistic dungeon, whether it be nothing more than a long collapsed mine or the bustling underbelly of a metropolis. Each will share elements that define what it is and each will have things that are unique. The former greatly assists a castle keeper in dungeon building, providing basic guidelines, and this is of course the DM or GM, and quick and gritty playing, while the latter strikes a chord of creativity, letting the mind wander and develop as the game and setting needs. None of the following should be classified as canon and should be changed to suit the development schemes created, again, by the Castle Keeper. We're looking at this as a, the possibilities for just a generic system. So the first thing you would be rolling up here with a d20 is the purpose, uh, the reason that the dungeon exists. Now, in this conception of dungeons, I believe, there's really not necessarily a backstory or a history so much that you are developing, but the dungeon does have a stated purpose. So if I rolled a 12, it would be an economic dungeon. That's kind of interesting, actually. So let's look and see what he has to say about that economic crafted to provide monetary assistance, commonly in the form of a mine. A dungeon of this sort will typically have reminders of its purpose scattered around, from wall-mounted torches to coins and picks lying on the ground. Depending Depending on the nature of the structure and activity, there might even be workable loads remaining. Interesting. An economic dungeon does not need to be a mine, as it could function as a secretive location for the trafficking of illicit goods and services, or even a means to hide such things. In the latter case, all manner of legal traps are prone to exist, though in the former cases, typically only natural traps such as explosive or corrosive gases will be present. And then the other options here are shelter. I'm not going to read you everything here, but I want to provide you with a taste of the richness of this, this uh, supplement because I think it's, it's really great. Uh, there's shelter as a protective place. Prisons, of course, very typical. Religious tombs, temples, and sanctuaries are the typical dungeon type. And we have experimental dungeons, places where the extraordinary is performed. And there's a note here that says, seldom does a dungeon serve a single purpose, though it is not impossible for that to happen. So again, you could create some kind of history for your dungeon, either through this system or through other systems that exist to, to do that for you. Then we get to the builder who built the dungeon, arguably just as important as why it exists. Each condition of creation imparts a certain level of similarity. And so we can roll here on this, and we got a 13. So it was built by a burrowing monster. Now, if you're going to connect the burrowing monster to the economic origins of the dungeon, you would have to kind of figure out, it says here, some beast, whether intelligent or not, with a natural ability to burrow through ground, is responsible for the groundwork. And again, in this case, since we it was an economic, we would probably say, it was created by an intelligent beast. Of course, it could have been created by some overlord who was intelligent, who um, had to, in his thrall, say, some type of unintelligent beast to do the work for it. Other types of builders are either natural conditions, magic, or some type of combination. We have locations here, civilization, ruins, underwater aerial, planar, some type of a combination here. 
I'm not going to go through, I'm not going to go through absolutely everything here, but we have a size, how many levels it has, the width, the length, which may or may not be of relevance to you in how detailed you want to be, the number of entrances, entrance method. And again, here, something like this, I would say, is a place that could be a spot for some narrative development. So we've got now uh, we're dealing with an economic dungeon that is created by some type of burrowing monster, either an intelligent monster or somebody who is in serfdom to somebody else of intelligence, and it's just a basic door entry. So not too much there. Um, how old is this? Well, we get a D20 roll and we got a 17, so it's 2D4 decades old. So that says to me 2D4 decades is going to be within the lifespan, say, of a party. So right there you could pick that up in a narrative manner to connect that to a reason that your current existing party is going into the dungeon. Maybe there is some something that happened in the dungeon or they're seeking something that is connected to the existing party because the dungeon is really not that not that old. We have dungeon entrance numbers, then we have graphs to help you lay out your dungeon and to you know to draw it out if you wanted to if you wanted to use those and then we get into the shapes the width the length the depth the number of exits of each room and certain types of features whether it has combination of features so again with the d20 roll here of a 19 there would be a door and we then we would roll on table 9a to see how many there would be a trap so we would roll on table 9b to see what type of trap it is and there's both uh well let's see that's the 9b so let's see what kind of a trap would we have in this current room um it's accessible visible it is not lethal and it's going to give a difficulty level again you would need to port those into the rules of your own game but a non-lethal trap what's a non-lethal trap well let's see a non-lethal trap here oh it's a magic so some type of magical trap that's non-lethal in our economic dungeon maybe maybe that magical trap if it's at the entrance if we're talking at the beginning here is something that is designed to see how wealthy you are why are you coming to this dungeon if you're trying to steal some of the economic resources of the dungeon who are you that is trying to do that from an economic perspective so maybe there's some magic that will detect that I don't know, just the thought. There are, of course, other types of traps. There are movement traps that will put you uh, somewhere else in the dungeon up to a certain distance. There are lethal traps, arrow, guillotine, crushing, and you can continue to get the damage from this or from your own system. Pit traps, of course. What would a dungeon be without pit traps? And there is discussion here about the impact of these traps. So for example, for example, this guillotine trap are designed to remove body parts, whether hands or feet. Sometimes these traps are meant to behead an unfortunate victim. One in 20 such traps are the latter and result in death unless disarmed before being strong, sprung. So it gives you a little bit more of a way of having the trap be created and then also having the trap have an effect. So there's severe blood loss equal to 1d3 points per round until magically healed, for example. And then it says castle keepers are encouraged to develop rules for the loss of particular body parts. So it gives you something to further further develop the environment from. And it gives you some examples of what non-magical element traps could deal damage as through the application of an elemental force such as fire, acid, cold, or electricity. They are, as said, non-magical. You can use your own discrepancy, but it is suggestive of something a little bit different than the typical just damage that might be done. We have um, how common are the chances of a monster within a certain environment. And then we have a list of, I'll say, I'll call it say thematic monster tables. And by thematic, I mean thematic to the environment of where your dungeon is. So if your dungeon is in a hot desert, you can have this list of these are the common monsters you would encounter uncommon and rare. What I really like about this, even if you have to roll something on here and then find it in your rule set, is that sometimes doing just a random table as I, as you've seen me do in other videos of a list, just a random list of, from somebody's uh, bestiary, you're, you're going to get something that doesn't make any sense. So if you're in a cave 
if you're in some sort of cave trap and then you are see the cave dungeon and then all of a sudden there's something like I don't know a wolf shows up or a bear it doesn't it doesn't really make thematic sense whereas here you have this grouped for you they are um, things that you would encounter if your dungeon was in a forest if it was in the hills in the desert that's cold versus hot jungle and swamp in the mountains in the plains this I think is extremely useful because it gives you some confidence that what you're going to roll is going to be thematically relevant. Now, as mentioned, you're going to then have to go find the stats for, you know, an ogre mage, which may not be actually in your system, but you would then have to translate it to something that made sense in your system. And then we have the planar, the common, and then just the underground, common underground things here. We have some NPCs that can show up in your dungeon, and it's going to give you their race, their um, gear and treasure level. We have dragons, and then of course we have other things like the decor of the dungeon, the environment in that way, which is great. Liquids that could be flowing through, acid, magma, blood, oil, poisons, some physical decorations. This is always my favorite. So we would roll here. This is a D100 table, and we would roll up to see. Let me find how I can do this. All right, I found them. And what could we possibly be finding? 21, we could be finding artwork. So we could go to the artwork table, assuming there is one here. Perhaps there is not. Well, I don't see an artwork table, but you could then design that yourself. I'm not sure that all of these, there's a couple that have tables. I guess they're listed here. Not all of them do. So these are the liquids, the temperature, the sounds, the odors, and the lighting. And we'll just take a quick look at these offerings to fill them in. And of course, magical pools. Now, I don't know where you would roll for a magical pool, but you could have the offerings, the magical offerings, the conditions that they bestow, and the impact of them, teleportation, money, treasure. We have the sounds that you can find in a dungeon, and we've seen this in other random dungeon generator supplemental materials that I've shown you, but I think that this can be always, always helpful. It's, uh, you know, they don't call it atmospheric for nothing. So if you rolled up a two, it would be a hiss, a soft hiss. I like that this has a secondary column um, that will explain to you, is it far away? Is it soft? Is it loud? That just adds a little bit of something. And um, you can see here, say that, call that a 16. There's loud crying coming from a room. Now, of course, I haven't developed the particular room, but I think you could see where the addition of this, and one might even want to start completing this as the first environmental part of a room, even before you get to the physical thing that is in there is there an odor there's a cooking odor well somebody's crying and cooking appropriate for a holiday perhaps if you're having some food preparation issues lighting we have a d20 on lighting and of course you would need to modify this based on what you were doing a soft glow well the soft glow could be torches the soft glow could be some type of light that's coming in from above depending on the kind of dungeon that it is. There's more of a sound table here. There's another D20 table, and we have a squeal in the distance. Again, perhaps thematic to somebody in an underground kitchen cooking something up. And let's see, what, is they, what they're cooking, what does it smell? It smells vinegary, a normal vinegary smell. So that's a look into most of what is in this supplement. Uh, just a few more things. This conditions. Um, this says conditions are not normally are normally not caused by magical effects, though they can be. And um, it says that corridors might be built in a dungeon in such a way that those unaccustomed to them feel a sensation of vertigo, spiraling upward in a gradual shift or direction, or they can cause you to feel trapped or confused. This is interesting, and the suggestion, particularly in a corridor, is nice. So perhaps if you had a corridor which generally speaking, almost just like, all right, well, is there a wandering monster here or whatever? Um, here, you could traverse that corridor and begin to feel tired or fatigued or overwhelmed. And 
Is that a magical feeling? Yes, it is. Well, who's causing that magic and how does that fit into your story? So if somebody's in the dungeon with a story behind them, the addition of this feeling of overwhelm should make sense by looking back on the narrative elements of your story that you have already developed. And, and of course, there are, there are room types here. And so we have a, well, a library. It's an orderly library. Again, nothing necessarily new, but putting it all together with the tables here, um, and here are some alchemical furnishings. If you rolled up some type of magical room that you could build together, and well, that's just that's a D <laughs> what that is is a D one hundred table. So a fifty nine, we have a basic. Uh, it's a basic tool, I guess. There's some basic types of tools in in here wherever we are. It's a nice package all together to help you create a dungeon, a three-dimensional dungeon that has a that has a little bit of a history, a little bit of a purpose behind it, and that you can get thematic monsters in it, wandering monsters in it, as well as some NPCs and traps. And there was, uh, I don't know if I skipped over, I'm not sure actually how much treasure there is here. Let me let me just see whether there's not really seeing a ton of treasures. I think there was, well, there's some magical pools, but indeed I actually don't see a lot of treasures. And I should say one more point. I've not printed out the very end of this is um, a longer list of torture chambers and a sample dungeon. I did not print that out for myself because I don't like to have torture chambers in my dungeon and I certainly did not need a lengthy list of that but it does exist. What does not exist, as I'm, as I'm noting now, at least as far as I can tell, is any type of substantial treasure list. So we have a, um, a list here of treasure types. This may then refer to external material from the rule set that it is, but in any case, you could figure that out for yourself in terms of how many treasures it were, they were, or how important they were, that's easily enough done outside of this basic system. So there is a look about uh, Great Supplement Engineering Dungeons, a random, random generation system, and I wish you all a happy holiday.